Good morning. 8.30, are we ready to begin? We are. <laughs> Welcome, dear guests, to the final event of the Nordic Project, the first thousand days in the Nordic countries. This project is a large multinational collaboration that was launched over the Icelandic presidency in the Nordic Council of Ministers over three years ago, ending today with its grand finale. Uh, we're so very pleased to have you all here with us today, uh, with 300 people scheduled to be here in the auditorium, and an additional 300 registered to participate online. To you all, welcome. Uh, my name, uh, funny, the only thing I'd forget is my name. <laughs> my name is Nicole Lee Mosty, and I'm the director of the Multicultural Information Center here in Iceland, and I'll be your host this morning. I'll make sure we maintain a very tight schedule and pay due diligence in reminding our speakers that they have five minutes remaining, one minute remaining, and after that, I'm turning off your mic. Or for you, Willem, I might just flash a red card. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I would kindly request that speakers remember to glance in my direction. I'll be sitting here and I'm wearing a white jacket so you can't miss me. Uh, during the course of your talk to see if I'm waving at any time a warning sign to you. Uh, we have an exciting program lined up today, but before we start, two important practical matters. Number one, this conference is being streamed and recorded, meaning we aim to have the content of today's event publicly available after the conference. One of the main aims of the First Thousand and a Thousand Days project is to raise awareness of the importance of early years for lifelong mental health, so all content produced by the project will be accessible to the public, including this conference. Maybe I should slide in one more thing. Let's turn off our, put our phones on silent. Thank you. Number two. Since we have hundreds of participants, both here and person, and at the Harper Conference uh, and online, we will exclusively be using the app Slido for audience engagement today. Again, I, I would like to direct your attention here to the right, the screen on the top, where you can see the, um, the QR code and the, our hashtag, First Thousand Days. Slido is very easy to use uh, and offers the option of posting questions and comments either anonymously or under your name. Many of you might already be familiar with Slido, but for, for those of you who are new to Slido, you simply down down the, uh, the uh, app, the QR code, visit the website Slido, www.slido.com, and enter the conference code. Again, hashtag first thousand days. Um, you can do this at any time during the presentation. You don't need to wait until the speakers have completed their talks. You can send in your questions. That's very interactive, very easy. Um, you can also vote on questions and comments made by other participants and by liking them so, so they were prioritized. So if you find a question to be relevant and very good and you'd really like an answer, like, like, like. Um, so please go ahead and download that while you have a moment. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to, I'm honored to introduce and welcome the Icelandic Minister of Health, Mr. Willem Thor Thorsson, to the podium for this opening address. Thank you. Dear Chair, uh, guest speakers and other guests, good morning. It is an honor and with great pleasure that I welcome you all here today to celebrate the culmination of this three-year Nordic collaborative uh, project launched as part of the 2019 Icelandic Presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers. And once again, through this collaborative, professional, elaborated work on this important topic. From the analysis stage towards the policy recommendations, we have indeed further established the importance of the Nordic cooperation. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers 
of this event, the Directorate of Health, Sigrun Daniel and her people and all the people behind this for leading this valuable project and for organizing this important Nordic conference. Also, I would like to thank each of our impressive speakers today for taking part in enhancing the value of this wonderful event. The first thousand days in the Nordic Countries project is indeed a flagship of best practices for supporting a healthy start in life, or as we phrase it in Icelandic, lengi bir of this together. I will leave you with a test of translation. I am certain that today, even this event will be inspiring and provide added value insight in how to build a better future by seizing this window of opportunity that presents itself in the first thousand days in the life of a child. Promoting and supporting young children's well-being and providing them with a healthy start in life is the cornerstone for building a healthier society and we simply cannot afford to miss this opportunity. We must seize it. I am delighted to inform you that Althingi, our parliament, just recently passed a new policy for mental health until 2030, where one of the four cornerstones is indeed mental health promotion and prevention of ill mental health inter interrelated to public prevention and health. The topics we will discuss today align, let me say beautifully, with our new policy and will provide valuable insights that can help us develop strong action plans to further reach our policy goals. The Nordic countries have valuable strengths that can enable us to reach our goals. Some would say we are in many ways privileged. But also, we face challenges that need to be addressed. The key to succeed, most likely, in my mind, is to appreciate that we have, at the same time, uh, to acknowledge these challenges and approach the task ahead, probably with an open mind and with a blend of humility and respect. We must not only take an intersectoral, interdisciplinary approach to address the work ahead, but we must also join hands across borders because together we are much stronger and more likely to reach our common goals of building exemplary societies. I'm not saying that I'm afraid of the red card, but I just don't like it. <laughs> Once again, let me thank you all, our organizers, speakers, and each and every one of you for investing your time and sharing with us today. And I am certain we will have a productive conference with valuable output for us all, and most importantly, our children. Enjoy your day, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and now, I died. Uh, please welcome the Icelandic Minister of Education and Children, Mr. Ausmundur Eina Dalrason. And we'd I'd like to um, also mention the fact he was one of the first two ministers here who launched this project three years ago. And we're very honored to have you here today. Again, five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Dear guests, both uh, here in the conference room and also those who are online. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be with you here today at the final event of the first 1,000 days project. In the beginning, I would like to congratulate those uh, who have led this project. Uh, and I must say that I'm grateful to have, been, to have been able to be part of the project from the beginning. From its launch as a Minister of Social Affairs and Children in 2019, to being the one receiving the results and discussing them here today as a Minister of Education and Children. As much of an honor as it was to launch this project, it's an even greater honor receiving the results and being responsible for finding ways to respond to the challenges reflected in the project deliverables and getting to work on them in the coming years in good cooperation with all relevant stakeholders. I must say that I'm very proud of this project and I can already see that the results will be of great value for our journey here in Iceland as well as in the Nordic countries as a whole. As all of you sitting here today are aware of, the first thousand days are crucial time in children's development as this period lays the foundation for children's well-being and learning throughout life. Children's well-being is a topic very close to my heart. And since I became a minister, I've emphasized achieving big structural changes for and with children here in Iceland, focusing on finding ways to offer early support with the aim of laying better foundation for a prosperous childhood as early as during pregnancy. We have emphasized breaking barriers in order to increase coordination and cooperation when it comes to services for children. And in the beginning of this year, a new comprehensive act on the integration of services in the interest of children's prosperity entered into force. The legislation provides a framework for early support for all children from pregnancy until they reach adulthood. Those changes are the beginning of our journey to unobstructed unobstruct or unhindered access to services for children with the aim of improving quality of life, happiness and prosperity. In February this year, a new Ministry of Education and Children was formally established. The structure of this new ministry is based upon five pillars that in my mind are all the key elements in building a society where the needs of all children are met. These pillars are education, health and well-being, safety and protection, quality of life and social status, and participation and social connection. Furthermore, an increased emphasis will also be placed on basing the work of this new ministry on reliable data and as part of that, a comprehensive stat statistical overview of children's health, well-being and rights will be made available through a special dashboard this uh, coming fall. I believe these structural changes will help us in our journey of maximizing children's prosperity from early age and taking the right steps to support children in their first years of life, including building up education system that meets the need of all children for the being of uh, preschool. As the Minister of Education and Children, I'm very eager to strengthen the first level of the educational system, as well as, Im as improving services to families in the gap between the end of parental leave and the start of preschool. I, I congratulate you all on this day and I look forward to take even bigger steps when it comes to building a society where all children have the opportunity of getting the best possible start in life. Because what is more important than children and how, uh, we, uh, how the society helps them to be uh, successful and happy in life and well-being. I thank you very much for listening and I hope you have a prosperous day ahead. Thank you very much. He left me with 20 seconds to say we are so very fortunate to live in a country where our legislators are willing to put mental health and children first. Could we please clap? Uh, our next speaker is equally as important, Sigrun Danielsdottir. She's a project manager for mental health promotion at our Directorate of Health. Excuse me. 
at, at our Directorate of Health in Iceland, and she's a special project manager for the project The First Thousand Days in the Nordic Country. She will tell us more about the project itself, how it came to be, what findings it has produced, and the policy recommendations that have been developed as a result to the project. Please welcome Sigrun. Thank you so much. Before I, I begin, I wanted to notify that we have started our first Slido exercise for today. So this is just uh, to warm us up, um, and you can vote in the poll uh, on the screen and in your in your phones. So I hope you've all downloaded the Slido app or opened the website. Um, yes. So I'm very honored and happy to be able to um, have you all here with us today to tell you about our project that we have been working on for the past three years. Um, this has been a, a very long road and we're so happy to see it come to an end. Um, we, over the past few decades, we have become as um, as people, we have come, become increasingly aware of the importance of the first few months and years in children's lives. Uh, we have begun through science to learn that uh, these, this period in life is paramount to children's future well-being because this is the time where brain development is at its peak. This is a time where, in fact, the foundation is laid for neural pathways and brain regions that dictate all of our future learning, language, uh, emotion regulation, and behavior. And this is the time of our lives when um, our brains are developing faster than at any other point in our lifetime. Um, we also know that a child's ability to trust, to love, to feel compassion, to regulate their emotions and form positive relationships of their own in the future, develops through close, intimate relationships with their caregivers. And this really lays the foundation for good mental health throughout the entire lifespan. So this is why we wanted to focus on this period in this Nordic project. The nations of the world are increasingly becoming aware of the importance of um, uh, investing in this first years of children's lives because it's of such paramount importance. So we wanted to take a closer look at how the Nordic countries are managing to support mental health at the beginning of life. This, these are the countries that um, aim to be the best countries in the entire world for children. So we wanted to take a closer look. How are we doing in promoting mental health and well-being during pregnancy? How are we doing in supporting positive parent-child uh, relationships? How are we doing in identifying and responding to early risk factors? And how are we doing in supporting well-being among the youngest children in preschool or early childhood education and care, preschool and, and daycare? Um, so we started by doing an extensive situation analysis looking into these factors in the participating countries. We uh, did a, a comprehensive review of the scientific evidence of the interventions and the assessment tools that we are using in the Nordic countries to assess and support uh, well-being among children. And finally, we used all the knowledge that we gathered during the project to form policy recommendations for the Nordic countries in how we can actually do better in this area. So the participating countries are Iceland, where the Directorate of Health has been leading this project. Uh, we have Helse Directoratet and Erbub Östersör in Norway, ITLA Children's Foundation and THL in Finland, uh, Sunna Styrelsen in Denmark, uh, Folk, Folk I'm not very good at pronouncing these Scandinavian names, uh, in Sweden, and then in all of these countries we have had um, consulting groups professionals that we have turned to for, for advice and, and for recommendations. And there has been a Nordic reference group where all of the countries have had representatives as well as from Greenland and the Faroe Islands. So this is a huge collaboration. 
our situation analysis revealed that, as we suspected, the Nordic countries have very important strengths when it comes to supporting a healthy start in life. We have free health care and social services. We have high participation in prenatal care and infant and child health care. We have universal access to early childhood education and care, substantial parental leaves, screening for risk factors during, and after, uh, during pregnancy and after birth. There's a growing emphasis in prenatal care and infant and child health care to support mental health uh, among the uh, pregnant women um, and the parents, as well as supporting a good uh, parent-child relationship. However, we also learned that there are um, numerous areas, oh, sorry, yeah, numerous areas that we have for improvement. For example, we found that um, we can do really much better in using evidence-based methods in our work. We can do much better in supporting uh, professional development among the staff who are working in these fields. Um, to, to identify more systematically and more thoroughly um, early risk factors among children and families and responding to them in an evidence-based way, um, to intervene early, um, to have easy access to services, um, to address the, in the inequity in access to services that we found throughout the, all of the Nordic countries have unequal access to services depending on, for example, where you live. Um, there are weaknesses in our cross-sectoral collaboration and challenging challenges relating to um, early childhood education and care. For example, there are high stress levels in these um, areas that we are working with the very the youngest and the most vulnerable children in environments that often suffer from um, uh, shortage of staff, um, lack of professionally um, uh, educated staff, um, uh, too many children per person uh, in the staff, and, and things like that, that we found are quite universal across the Nordic countries. Um, when we did the scientific, the, the scientific review, <coughs> we uh, got the help of two research teams at the Regional Center for Child and Youth Mental Health and Child Welfare uh, at the University of Tromsø in Norway um, and the Itla Children's Foundation in Finland. So there was a, a huge number of people working on um, looking into the evidence of uh, common uh, methods and assessment instruments that we are using in the Nordic countries. And the editors for, for this work were uh, Monika Martinusen and Mario Kurki. Um, of the 63 psychosocial interventions that we um, found were in active use in the Nordic countries, over half of them were rated with the very lowest level of evidence. So really not anything to, to uh, substantial to rely upon when it comes to are these interventions working as we are hoping that they will. Um, and only 3% really reached the highest level of evidence, which is not only that they were uh, studied with rigorous research methods, but also studied within the Nordic countries. Because we can't just take results from um, countries that really have different systems from us, different um, uh, societal factors, uh, and just place them in our environment and assume that they work the same. We have to study how they work um, in the setting that we are um, providing them. Um, when it came to uh, assessment tools and psychological tests, uh, we found that about 12% had the lowest level of evidence and 12 the highest, where the majority was in the second lowest range, which means that they had some evidence but not good enough that we could really rel rely on them. Um, so after we had done the situation analysis and, um, and the, the review of scientific evidence, we learned that there was a lot of areas where we could do more. And 
for example, the, the scientific evidence review revealed that even though a large number of uh, interventions and assessment instruments are available to parents and young children in the Nordic countries, evidence of their, on their effectiveness and psychometric properties is often lacking or insufficient. So it's important to en enhance research effort in the Nordic region to strengthen the evidence base of interventions and in instruments that practitioners rely upon in order to assess and support mental well-being for children and families during this critical period in their lives. So we used all of this information to form policy recommendations to guide us in a way forward. What is it that the Nordic countries need to focus on in order to actually um, create the best um, circumstances for children and make sure that we um, continue to support um, a healthy and strong um, childhood, which leads to healthy and strong uh, nations, really. Um, first, and these are not in an order of uh, uh, importance. They are all equally important to us. So recognizing the importance of the first thousand days of life for lifelong mental health and well-being. This is something that we really need to wake up to because it's so important and it all of our the rest of our lives really depend on this period so uh, we have to prioritize it accordingly um, we also have to uh, focus much more on providing comprehensive support for parents during children's first thousand days of life to identify and respond more systematically to risk factors early in life to improve equity and quality in services for young children and their families, strengthen cross-sectoral collaboration for the benefit of young children and families, and to advance research, knowledge, and understanding about the first thousand days of life. So for the, for the first uh, recommendation, this means that we have to strengthen policy focus on the first thousand days of life. So reviewing existing policies and action plans to include a focus on the early years or develop new ones that focus specifically on the first years of life, including pregnancy. Support implementation through clearly defined implementation plans. Ensure that protection of the rights of children are present in all policies and insert ways to safeguard these rights in existing policies and action plan plans and prioritize funding for services for expectant and new parents and children under two years old. Um, when it comes to parental support, we need to actively involve both the birthing parent and the non-birthing parents in prenatal and infant and child healthcare. When we op only focus on the birthing parent or the mother, we are only getting half of the picture. So we need to include both parents and offer group and individual parent support to all expectant and new parents where the focus is simply to prepare for this important role. We assume that everybody is born with the good parental skills, but this is a, a very risky assumption to make. Um, and we don't assume these uh, comparable skills for any kind of other important uh, roles in our lives. We know that they require um, training and knowledge and uh, support. So why should parenthood be any different? Um, Include digital solutions in providing care, information, and interventions to parents and increase flexibility in combining work and family lives for parents of young children. It's really not very um, realistic to expect parents to be able to juggle a full-time job and full-time parenthood of infants in a successful way. It leads to a lot of stress, usually for everybody. Um, Identify and respond systematically to risk factors early in life. This means to implement valid and reliable proven methods in prenatal and infant and child, and child health care to identify the major risk factors. Mental health difficulties is one part, but also social difficulties, relationship difficulties between the parents, alcohol and substance abuse, violence and trauma. These are among the critical factors that we need to assess systematically throughout pregnancy and the first years of children's lives um, to make sure that we catch problems early and help. Um, to ensure that, of course, these 
assessment and interventions reach both parents and the child as applicable, and that we have systematic and tiered routines for follow-up after assessment and screening, where the emphasis is on early, appropriate, and evidence-based interventions. Um, improving equity and quality in services is hugely important. So we need to develop effective national strategies to address the inequity in services that we know are present in our systems to ensure adequate resources for providing quality individualized care in all services relating to young children and families. It was really heart aching to meet um, professionals working in these fields that all say the same things. We know how to help parents. We just don't have enough time. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough resources. So this is based on political will and it's something we really need to address if we're gonna do better. Offer regular skills development, professional guidance and high quality staff training on evidence-based practices within all systems that provide services for young children and families and to ensure that surveillance and quality control systems perform with adequate frequency, rigor and authority. Again, this also depends on having enough people and having enough resources. Um, Cross-sectoral collaboration is a high priority within all the Nordic countries, and we need to make sure that there is systematic collaboration between prenatal care and infant and child health care, so there is consistency across pregnancy and after the child is born. There, there can't be any walls between these two systems. Um, to establish systematic collaboration between infant and child health care and early childhood education and care, this is really lacking in the Nordic countries, where there is not, we have collaboration between um, primary health care and uh, primary school, but not the early stages. Um, and to ensure effective collaboration between, between specialized adult services, so services that are helping adults with severe problems like severe mental illness, alcohol and, and uh, substance abuse and things like that, they really need to be working consistently with the prenatal care and the infant and child health care, and to legally define the responsibilities of all of these systems so that they know what their responsibilities are towards children's well-being. And finally, advancing and prioritizing Nordic research, we need to stop um, relying ex uh, to um, such a high degree on research that is not performed in our uh, area of the world. We need to do more of uh, Nordic research that can inform us about how our systems are working and to encourage a special call within the Nordic countries for research on the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions and implementation that covers all levels in a step care manner. These were identified in the uh, scientific evidence report and they really stress the importance of um, uh, focusing on these gaps in, in our knowledge and uh, practice. To promote, and also to promote knowledge about infant mental health and the significance of the early years to everybody who, is, who has a young children in their lives, either as a parent or as a professional. Um, we really need to um, raise awareness that infant mental health is a specialized area containing specialized knowledge, and we need to promote this knowledge um, in a wider scale. So all of these results from this project can be found in our three reports. They are available online, easy to access, um, and finally the policy recommendations. So they can all be found on um, both on the website for the Nordic Council of Ministers as well as this conference website, first uh, thousand days dot is slash about the project. Thank you. We're not going to send her away yet. We've got a couple of good questions here. Sigrun. Yes. What about building public awareness? Do you think society knows enough, not only parents and direct professionals, but also the entire population? Yes, I think this is something that our um, last policy recommendations is addressing, that we, no, we don't think that there is enough knowledge out there, and we really need to do better in promoting awareness and knowledge. That is part of what we are doing with this conference. Um, that is why we are, for example, having all of our content 
publicly av available. Um, we will have a recording from this conference available to anyone. So anyone working in this field really, um, we should all um, join our forces and try to promote the knowledge that we have um, so that it, bec it becomes a, um, a common truth in our societies because only then I think will we have the the public sort of oh, this is my cue <laughs> um, the public sort of uh, push uh, to the to the people in charge to really invest in this period okay is, is there room for one more question yeah. Okay. I think so. We'd we'd really like to know, and I, th I think this is a this is a, a question collectively, uh, Nordic ministries and health authorities. It's 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 basically to you. Uh, how do you intend to continue to utilize the knowledge gained through the project research funding? Are we going to be seeing an influx of funding for research and project development in the months to come? Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> this project is time based. It concludes with this conference. So we have done all that we can do uh, within the realms of this project. But we really hope that this is going to inspire our governments to uh, focus more on this area and to realize that all of our future mental health depends on this. Looking right at the health minister. <laughs> and that really means the prosperity of our societies. So I hope so. We throw one more question. We've got one okay. more minute. And that was um, a question regarding enhanced education through cross-sectional cooperation. Are we seeing any movements in this direction? Can you, can you say it again? Uh, cross-sectoral cooperation, working inter, uh, intersectionally. Uh, healthcare, are, child Are we going to see more yeah, of that? Yeah. Are we seeing more? Are the trends there? And we'll be seeing The trends are definitely more. there. Yes, absolutely. And like the, I mean, all of the Nordic countries had, when we were doing this project, had legislation uh, demanding cross-sectoral collaboration of the systems that are working with children. Iceland was the only country that had to say, sorry, we don't have anything like that. But like our uh, Minister of uh, Education and Children just um, described to you, uh, we got a legislation passed very recently addressing spe specifically this. So yes, I, I really think that there is an, uh, an increasingly more and more focus on this. And we are all learning that this is really the only way to help anybody is to work together. Thank you, Sigrun. Thank you very Thank you. much. And while I have one moment, I say I see here looking across the room people from all different sectors. Use the brakes, speak together, and move forward together. Um, next, I would, I, would, I would like to welcome, and I'm extremely pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Alan Gwagwad. And uh, Dr. Gwagwad is a consultant and a prenatal psychiatrist and president of the UK Maternal Mental Health Alliance. His keynote address today is entitled, Better Mental Health for Mother and Baby is Everyone's Business! Exclamation point. Welcome, Dr. Gregor. Well, it's a huge honor to be here uh, and, and a huge pleasure. Um, having been nurtured in my early life, actually uh, throughout most of my life, by a mother who was Norwegian and came from Bergen, I, I feel a strong sense of affiliation with you all, uh, and uh, in a way extremely proud uh, to see what the Nordic countries are doing in relation to the early years and to hear the minister uh, uh, describing, or the ministers describing uh, their commitment, uh, uh, very strong commitment uh, to uh, the early years uh, and to forwarding this really important agenda. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking to you a little bit about our experiences in the UK with this. Now, the UK, as you will know, is way behind you 
uh, in terms of uh, nurturing uh, humans within our society and particular, uh, particularly uh, young humans within our society. Um, but there are some areas where uh, we uh, have managed to make some advances uh, and there are many areas where we have learned a lot of things in recent years. Uh, and I'd like to share uh, some of those with you. So who do we rely on uh, for the quality uh, of nurturing care uh, in the early years, uh, which, as has already been acknowledged and you all know, is so critically important to our lives and to our society now uh, and, in the, and in future generations. And I might add, not just one generation, but science is now telling us uh, these, ha these effects go on for at least two generations. Uh, so, so this investment is really important. Well, who do we rely on? Well, we rely on the primary caregivers. Uh, and in most societies throughout the world, pretty much in all societies throughout the world, possibly less so in Iceland than in any other country in the world, uh, we rely on mothers. Um, and then to a slightly lesser extent, parents or, or, or parenting partners. Uh, and so um, they are critically important. They are the environment uh, for both the fetus uh, and the baby, um, the most critical element of, of, uh, of the environment. And what is it about them uh, that creates that environment? Well, it's their mental functioning. It's not their liver function tests, it's not their bone density, um, it's not their hemoglobin levels, although those are all pretty important as well. It is their mental functioning. And as has already been said by Sigrun, this is the most important thing uh, and the most difficult thing that any of us ever does in our lives, whatever our fantastic professional skills, however wonderfully clever and committed you are uh, to what you do, uh, uh, having a child and delivering the best possible care for that child is the most difficult thing we do, and we need our best possible mental functioning uh, in order to do that. And what's one thing we can guarantee uh, with this? Well, we can guarantee that we'll get it wrong. Uh, that's 100% sure. And as I have learned to my cost, when they get older, they'll also tell you all the things that you got wrong. So, so you'll never escape it. So let's think a little bit about mental functioning. Uh, and as a psychiatrist, of course, my training is in mental dysfunction. Um, and one of the labels that we psychiatrists uh, give to uh, a very common aspect of uh, when things go wrong with our minds is depression. Uh, and within that label are all sorts of individual personal experiences, but very gruesome personal experiences. Uh, and if we look at how common this is uh, in women in the perinatal period, um, uh, it is really startling. Uh, and this figure of 14% uh, for uh, prevalence of depression at any one point. Uh, so this is not throughout the period of, of uh, uh, pregnancy and the postnatal years. This is at any single time you might wish to measure it in that population. In Iceland, it's around 14%, which is pretty much the same uh, as in most other uh, countries where it's been measured. Uh, although in some low- and middle-income countries, the rates are, are uh, substantially higher. Uh, and I put this column in red uh, uh, because uh, in most countries of the world, pretty much actually all countries of the world, if we're honest about it, um, this is not just the tallest column compared to other serious health complications of maternity, um, but this is also the column that does not generally have dedicated, specially trained staff delivering care. All these other physical aspects of maternity care and postnatal care have well-trained staff who know what they're doing with those, those health difficulties. With mental health, that is generally not the case. Now, you may be a little bit more advanced uh, in Iceland uh, with this, uh, but I think, uh, as we've just heard, uh, there are very considerable challenges in turning that column from red to blue. And this is very sad, really, because this is a fantastic opportunity in the lives not only of parents, and I talk mainly about mothers here uh, because most of the research is in mothers, but much of what I'm saying or going to say 
uh, applies to fathers as well, although not always to such a great degree. Uh, mothers are more affected by mental health problems and the impact of those mental health problems are greater in mothers in almost all of the studies that have looked at this. Um, so if we look at women of, of childbearing age and if we look at women uh, during the first few years of their children's lives, uh, the most common time for them, period for them to develop uh, uh, depression uh, is during the pregnancy. And in this particular study in South London and now many other studies that have looked at the period prevalence, so how common is depression across the whole of the pregnancy, the finding is about one in three women are suffering from depression at some point uh, during uh, the pregnancy um, and about one in six in the one year afterwards and then about one in six in the next 14 years of their child's life. So this is absolutely the best time to pick this up if, you, if we're serious uh, uh, about picking up mental health difficulties um, uh, as early as possible. Not only does this apply to uh, what we psychiatrists call the more mild or moderate uh, uh, conditions in, in poor mental health, uh, and I think this is often misunderstood because by that, by mild or moderate, I do not mean less suffering, um, but I mean uh, less acute and less dramatic and probably less dangerous mental health suffering. But it also applies uh, in the much more severe conditions, the much more high risk and complex conditions. Um, and we know, and we have known for some time, and this has been shown in several countries of the world, but here's the UK data, um, right back to the 1980s, uh, showing very clearly that the highest risk for, for the, in, in human lives um, for developing a severe mental health problem uh, is in the first few days and indeed hours postnatally. Uh, and this is, uh, in this big graph, you can see the risk uh, of uh, admission to hospital um, for psychosis uh, in the first few days and hours. Uh, replicated much more recently uh, in a similar population. Not only is this the most common time in human existence, and it only happens in women, the most common time in human existence for becoming psychotic um, and being admitted to a psychiatric hospital, but these illnesses are the most severe illnesses we see in the whole of psychiatric practice. They are the most rapid onset and the most dangerous illnesses. And anybody who has seen a woman, for example, with a postpartum psychosis uh, will know that, that this uh, can happen from one minute to the next uh, and endanger the life of that woman and sometimes, fortunately, very rarely, uh, the life of the baby as well um, uh, within, within a few hours. And this is probably largely the result uh, of uh, either new episodes or relapses of bipolar disorder. And as far as I know from the, from the literature that I've seen, your rates of bipolar disorder are pretty similar uh, in Iceland to uh, uh, other countries where this has been measured. Uh, and so this data probably also applies, although to my knowledge has not been replicated in Iceland. Uh, this is a study done in Boston. Uh, which looked at uh, a particular group of women with bipolar disorder, those who stopped their medication in pregnancy, and indeed most women with bipolar disorder decide without medical advice to stop their medication uh, before seeking medical advice. Um, and that is uh, the red line here, and you can see about 50% of them during the course of the pregnancy had a relapse of their illness. Uh, but the yellow line is when they gave birth, uh, and if you follow uh, that red line, you can see that of those who were well at the time of birth, 70% became ill postnatally. There are almost no other examples in the whole of healthcare where we know in advance a risk of becoming ill as high as this. What have we done with this information since we've had it in the last 20 years across the world? almost nothing. If this was cardiology, the scandal would shut down health ministers and health services throughout the world because it's mental health in women. Okay, well, it's just a shame, isn't it, really? Never mind. Let's move on. And incidentally, in this uh, study, they elegantly also looked at women who weren't pregnant 
um, uh, as you can see from the blue line, uh, who stopped medication for a variety of reasons and followed them up for the same period of time. And through the pregnancy um, period, the 40 weeks, uh, the relapse rates are about the same. So there's nothing special about pregnancy except that women are more likely to stop their medication at that time. And they need highly specialized advice to help them manage their illness. But you can see when the birth happens, there's something fundamentally different uh, that happens at that time. So uh, this is as close as we get to saying there is such a thing as a perinatal mental health condition. But the big message around perinatal mental health is it's not that the conditions are different. There is really no such thing as postnatal depression. There's depression that happens during pregnancy and that happens postnatally. But with postpartum psychosis, there probably is something that's slightly different. But that's a relatively rare example. What's really different about mental health at this time is why you're all here, is that women are highly at risk at that time, and this is a critical, critical time in their lives, and it's a critical, critical time for the whole of society. This is what we rely on for our futures. And so we need to support and nurture and value uh, uh, what women are doing at this time and their mental well-being in a positive way, not in a negative, scary, I'm a psychiatrist and you're a high-risk woman way. And we know quite a lot about uh, these conditions uh, occurring at this time and quite a lot about the risk factors that can guide us, make us, help us to do useful things to help women. So just as very quick examples, um, uh, 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 an elegant study in the top left there uh, showing uh, uh, very clearly that women who have only ever been ill in the postnatal period with a psychosis uh, only seem to be at risk in a future pregnancy during the postnatal period, not antenatally. Whereas women who have had uh, illnesses at all times, uh, such as women who've had bipolar disorder, uh, at other times other than postnatally, also are at risk during the pregnancy. So really useful uh, information to share with women there. Uh, we also know uh, on, on this side here, uh, data showing very clearly that women who identify uh, that they become more unwell if they lack sleep are much more likely to have a postpartum episode, probably for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, but this is a really useful thing for them to identify. Um, and uh, people with bipolar disorder who are triggered by poor sleep very often know this very well. Um, and so this is a useful bit of information for them. Uh, uh, and then in, in this study here, um, one of the very important themes uh, in perinatal mental health um, uh, that is probably the essence of perinatal mental health is the relationship uh, between becoming unwell at this time uh, and past history of trauma, particularly childhood trauma in the mother. Uh, and what this study shows is that with psychoses, this doesn't appear to increase the risk substantially. If you've had yourself as a mother uh, uh, past traumas in your childhood, but for other conditions, and notably depression, uh, but I'll come back to, to that, um, this is a substantially important risk factor. And of course, there's a story there, isn't there? We know that early childhood traumas put you at risk in your adult life of actually every health condition, uh, physical and mental. Um, in fact, it is the strongest predictor we know of in the whole of healthcare for our future health, well-being, and how long we live. You're all familiar with the ACEs study, which, for example, shows that if you have six adverse childhood experiences um, in your childhood, then you will live 20 years shorter lives. 20 years, yeah? And have hundredfolds increase in things like suicidality, uh, 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 substance misuse, and so on. Uh, so huge, huge effects. Uh, and this is part of the perinatal story because, of course, uh, some, many of those adults will become parents and this is a time when these early childhood experiences will particularly affect them and one adverse childhood experience that will affect their children 
is their mother having been unwell, yeah? So, or father, indeed. Uh, and I, I keep saying, uh, uh, I'll keep emphasizing that, that most of this also applies to fathers, but to a slightly lesser degree. Okay, so some people, some of my colleagues, uh, only get excited by the most dramatic psychiatric outcomes. Uh, and, uh, you know, if mental health problems cause death, then suddenly they're interested. But otherwise, if it's just human suffering, well, it's too much to cope with, really. Um, uh, uh, and so even if you're only interested in death, the data in the UK is absolutely clear. If you look for the data, and in the last 20 years we've been looking for the data because suicides uh, in mothers happen much later than, say, postpartum hemorrhage, and if you don't go looking for it, you don't see it. Um, but what's absolutely clear over the last 20 years is psychiatric causes of death are the main cause of death in women having babies in the UK. Uh, and it remains true in the last confidential inquiry that we carried out. If you look after six weeks, so when, at the time when suicides tend to happen, suicides on their own, not all of psychiatric deaths, but just suicides on their own, after six weeks are the main cause of death in women having babies. Uh, and in Nordic countries, the story is not very different. Um, uh, and I've done the same blue and, and red colouring uh, just to emphasise the point uh, that although many women die from these conditions uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, this is the area where we are not actively doing uh, prevention and care by specially trained professionals who know about care uh, in the perinatal period. Uh, and I am very conscious that the numbers uh, of women giving birth in the whole of Iceland are relatively tiny uh, compared uh, to uh, uh, other Nordic countries and absolutely to the UK. Um, and I think you only had one maternal death in the last uh, inquiry period that you conducted here. So you won't be able to see these sorts of figures emerging, but there is no reason for thinking that the risk level isn't, isn't the same in Iceland as it is in other Nordic countries. And obviously, indeed, even in, in the UK, where we're talking about much higher numbers uh, of deliveries, of births, and much higher numbers, therefore, uh, of deaths, um, the lessons that we learn from these uh, pertain to um, uh, uh, the whole pyramid or iceberg, I think, is probably a, a better example in Iceland uh, of uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, so uh, it has been calculated that for every death, the lessons you learn probably apply uh, to 150 or so near misses uh, where death might have happened if it hadn't been averted by chance uh, or intervention. Uh, so important lessons to be uh, learnt from those. So I've talked a little bit about mother and mentioned father, um, uh, uh, um, but of course uh, the reason the title of uh, today's meeting is the first 1001 days and the emphasis um, uh, in our thoughts uh, for many of us um, is uh, what then happens to the child. Um, uh, for me, uh, um, as, a, uh, as a perinatal psychiatrist, mostly caring for mothers, although absolutely um, equal emphasis on the relationship between mother and child. I think it's a tragedy that we need children to be affected for anyone to care about the mental health of women at this time. It should be enough that there is terrible suffering going on in those individual adults. If they, were, if they had broken legs, nobody would question that an investment is needed in their health care. Um, for, for women on their own, or just women to be suffering uh, at huge rates at this time does not seem to attract the same level of attention from healthcare systems or from politicians. Uh, and that is a tragedy. Uh, but at the same time, the reality is that we do know from research largely over the last 20 years or so, and much of that research is the reason we're sitting here today, um, that children are affected. 
Now, really, really important message, particularly as I'm, here am I, one of the only men, there's another man there, and there's a, one of the only men in the room, and I'm up here, and you're down there. Most, mo most of my audience are women. Um, really, really important thing to emphasize to you, because statistically, something like a third of you will have had a mental health problem, or have one at the moment, uh, and many, many of you will have, have had children, and many and many of you will have had those two things together. A really important thing to emphasize is that most children look like they are absolutely fine and are absolutely fine. What we are talking about here is an increase in risk, and risk comes hand in hand with being a parent, okay? You don't want your children to be bullied at school, but you don't lock them in their bedroom for 18 years to stop them being bullied at school. You don't want them to be hit, hit by a bus, but it's good for them to walk to school. So you have choices to make as parents, and there is often no risk-free choice, and risk is just part of parenting. But what we find really difficult to cope with is new risks or risks that sound scary uh, that we maybe have not accepted as part of our thinking, understanding as cul and culture. Uh, and this is, is one of these. Um, and I think we can't sweep it under the carpet, as we say in the UK, and pretend this is not true, but we can understand it as one of the risks of being a parent and being a child and being a human being, yeah? And very important message that I repeat, not inevitable. The other thing that's really important and that the science is telling us is that these effects are not irreversible. Okay, so they absolutely can change and particularly they can be helped to change um, uh, uh, at any later stage, but the earlier the better. So what are these increases in risk? Well, I give you some examples of what is now a very big literature. Uh, so this is very early examples in the literature. Uh, two UK studies I'll quote to you, but there are now studies confirming this in populations all over the world. Um, anxiety in pregnancy from a large UK study uh, showed a doubling in the risk of child behavioral and emotional problems, and this study now goes on into, into the children aged twen over 20 years old, finding the same effects lasting uh, into adulthood, um, but not inevitable, okay, but a doubling of the risk of these difficulties uh, in uh, the children of women who have the highest rates of anxiety. Um, uh, um, and uh, the findings in the same study with depression showed exactly the same thing, and an additive effect if the depression went on, uh, not just in the pregnancy, but also postnatally, so an even greater effect if the, if the, the women were depressed uh, postnatally as well as antenatally. Uh, and here's another example of a study, uh, again, a UK study, again, a prospective, good quality, robust study. Um, uh, and what this study uh, uh, showed when they analyzed children that they'd followed up since they were fetuses and followed up the mothers with detailed interviews uh, throughout these children's lives since they were fetuses, uh, what they found when they analyzed, when they examined the data on the children who were depressed at the age of 16, was that every single mother of the children who were depressed at age 16, 100% of them, uh, uh, of them had had mothers who'd been depressed, mainly during the pregnancy. And at the time when this was found, when this finding emerged, this was a surprise. So at that stage, in, in 2000, the, the data came out in about 2007, um, we were surprised. We were looking at this data thinking, this, this can't be true, surely. But of course, as you know, in the subsequent 10, 15 years, uh, study after study after study has shown very similar findings. Now, really important, it's not the other way around, okay? It's not all children whose mothers have been depressed who become depressed. It's all children who are depressed at 16 had mothers who were depressed. Really, really important distinction. This is not an inevitable effect, okay? 
but it is an increase in risk, and it's an important risk. And if we really care about intervening early in child mental health problems, we need to think about the very, very early lives of those children, which doesn't mean you don't do anything for the 16-year-olds, but we start now trying to do something for those who will be children in 16 years' time. Yeah? And it is not the mother's fault. Okay? This is really important. I know that's a simplistic way of putting it, but we still think about mental health problems in this, I suspect, even in Icelandic culture, in this slightly negative, blaming um, uh, way. And we've got to stop doing that. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I mentioned this before. What is the biggest risk factor um, uh, for uh, having a mental health problem in the perinatal period, in this, in this example, depression, um, uh, antenatally? And the biggest risk factor we've identified in, in this study and in many other studies um, is actually the childhood of the mother. So you can see this story taking shape, can't you? We're seeing it going from one generation to the next generation. And one of the adverse adversities in our childhoods, of course, is if we have a parent um, and slightly bigger effect, particularly a mother who's had a mental health problem. So if we're looking for women at risk, and indeed women who are particularly disadvantaged, um, and for children at risk, we need to ask about the childhoods of the parents. Yeah? And then we are being truly perinatal in our outlook and in our thinking. And we can see this uh, in other studies that have confirmed this effect. Uh, we can see an effect drawing straight over from the mother's childhood to the outcomes for her children. Yeah? So this is one generation, but as I mentioned, we now have studies showing effects going on into the next generation. So your grandparents' childhood adversity will affect your outcomes. And think of your grandparents' lives here in Iceland. I've been to all your museums. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you're all at risk. <laughs> Maybe that answers why you are not only the happiest population, but you are also the most depressed population. And maybe your grandparents' adversity is still lingering. You know, now you are happy, but some of you are still dealing with the after effects of your grandparents' terrible, terrible childhoods. Interesting, isn't it? So we see this model emerging uh, where there's an interaction between perinatal mental health and childhood adversity going from one generation to the next. And this is a kind of simplification of what a lot of the research and the data is telling us is going on through a variety of mechanisms and processes, including epigenetics, that there isn't time to go into now. But this seems pretty clearly to be a model that is taking shape with good evidence base. And I told you, really importantly, not irreversible. Okay, Not inevitable, not irreversible. And this is a lovely example of a study that shows uh, that uh, the effect of maternal anxiety in pregnancy uh, uh, on um, the development of the child, the eff that negative effect or that negative risk um, completely disappears if there is a good attachment relationship uh, in, the f in the first uh, couple of years postnatally between mother and baby. Okay? So, we have all this fantastic information which is scary but actually is a most beautiful opportunity because we are the first generation to have this scientific knowledge that we can change the lives of generations to come. I mean, what an amazing, wonderful, beautiful opportunity for us as individuals, for us as societies, for politicians. I mean, what a gift, you know? We've got scientific data that you can change the lives of your population. Why wouldn't you do it? Okay, yeah, oh God, I better hurry up. So, but are we doing it? Well, this is data from the UK. 
This is data from Iceland. Of the 5% most severely ill, only 25% receive any help. Do we know what we need to do? And I'm going to whiz through slides now. Um, in, the, in the UK, we have models uh, with quite a lot of evidence base that tell us exactly what to do at different levels of need and complexity and risk. Um, and in the UK, many organizations, over 100, have come together to demand action from the government. Uh, and as part of that demand, we calculated, the London School of Economics calculated the costs um, of perinatal mental health problems. And I've recalculated it, but this is not entirely robust because I've used the UK way of calculating it, but I've converted into Krona with your birth rate. Uh, and this is costing you 7.7 7 billion pounds for every year of women giving birth, not, not taking direct action on this issue. And taking action is a good investment, Excuse as me, we Alan. know, and it's cheap um, compared to physical health care in maternity, much, much cheaper to do the mental health work, so why wouldn't you? And in the UK, our government has invested to start with in specialist services, turning the map green, as we call it, getting specialist services for women throughout the country, and we heard from... Excuse Sigrid. me, Alan. Yeah, I'm going to stop. Right, were, hang on. I was really trusted to hold the clock, and I let you run. Okay. So we're going to so have to be really quick. I'm going to show you my last slide, <laughs> which is uh, Nelson Mandela saying, vision without action is merely a dream, and that's where you're at now. Action without vision is merely passing time. You're not there because you've got a vision, but vision without, with action can change the world, and I would urge you to change the world. And remember what I said earlier, it's never too late, but it's never too early. Thank you Perfect. very much. You have a few minutes for a few questions, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to jump into the slidos, and I just want to remind you all that there'll be um, questionnaires, little polls, so keep your eye on your slido, and also use it, and, uh, those of you who are at home. Um, our first question, most, uh, our most uh, prioritized question, while training mental health professionals may take time, how can we use innovative solutions to help parents here and now? Perhaps simple IT. Yeah, so there are many apps developing um, and in place. Um, and I think we're going to be hearing some of the IT solutions, a, a Norwegian Mamma Mia, a Norwegian example, I don't know if they're here in the audience, um, uh, that has been evaluated. So there are uh, IT uh, solutions for, that can be helpful for some families, uh, but I would absolutely stress that it's all about relationships. And relationships with computers is not enough to solve the difficulties that everyone faces. That's it can be very helpful for some. That's very good, because our next question, and actually there's another question down here who didn't get as many votes, but it has to do with our partners, the other parent, uh, with, with a knowledge uh, of women's health during and after pregnancy. Is there any education anywhere for the other parent taking care of? How do we educate the other half of this most important pair? Oh, I, I think this knowledge, um, firstly, needs to be throughout society, and this was raised uh, previously. This needs to be common knowledge throughout society because all of society should be valuing and nurturing parents. So whether you're a mum who chooses or is, uh, uh, by circumstances, on her own looking after a child, or whether you have a partner or two partners, uh, you should be nurtured by people all around you. We need to all play our part uh, in nurturing families uh, with children. So it's, it's all about relationships. And you live in a fantastic, tiny little society. You must know everybody else in Reykjavik, surely, uh, and in the rest of Iceland. You know, nurture those who have young babies. Make them feel valued and pay lots more taxes for early years. <laughs> okay, the, the comment's over. No. Uh, the next question is, uh, with the knowledge of women's health uh, during and after pregnancy, oh, whoops, um, it was about the gestational, yep. in what gestational week is screening for mental depression, mental health recommended, and which method would you recommend? Okay, well, 
Um, you know, when we screen for blood pressure during maternity, it's not at one appointment, it's every time. And I think it should be the same with mental health. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, when, I would say, at every possible opportunity, and it should not be just midwives saying, please fill in this form or fill it in online, it should be midwives in the whole of everything that they do and the system that they work in saying, giving a strong message, we care about how you are feeling about your psychological well-being. Speak to us about it and asking. Uh, so giving that message very strongly. And it shouldn't just be professionals. It should be all of us saying, how are you feeling today? When I was pregnant, I felt absolutely shit. I hope you're OK. Um, uh, you know, all this openness about so mental health. Maybe community-based solutions where women come together and can speak about their mental Absol health and well-being. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, antenatal uh, care, classes, education, s schools, you know, it's never too early, it's never too late, it should be everywhere. I mean, mental health problems are everywhere, so why don't we make mental health solutions everywhere? Very good answer. Um, uh, one of the next questions was, how can we prove that women's mental health is not only... Oh, I am okay. The slide, oh, it jumps around. You guys are very active with your voting. Excuse me. Uh, what about long-term effects of, uh, fe uh, on the fetus or the baby of antidepressant medication during pregnancy? Okay. Um, so uh, I, I could do a whole hour's talk on that or a day. Um, uh, overall, the evidence at the moment suggests, now this is the, the kind of headline, suggests that if you are suffering from depression that responds to antidepressants, your fetus is better off having the depression treated than not having antidepressants. Okay, that's the headline. Now, in that is a whole load of detail, such as if you have a depression that doesn't respond to antidepressants, or if you don't have depression at all, then why would you take that medication? And loads of people are diagnosed with depression who do not have depression, they have the legacy of childhood trauma, which is more common than depression. So, you know, let's, let's get our understanding of what we're treating right. With antipsychotics, there's actually a very recent Nordic study, 2022, I think, of antipsychotics on long-term child development showing no effect at all of exposure to antipsychotics. So, in general, mental health medications are safe, and the message is... And that's, this is the kind of the overall picture, right? There's lots of detail, but overall they're safe. And, and the message is, if you need them and they work for you, take them. And don't feel ashamed to take them. But there are alternatives, and make sure they're working for you. Okay, thank and you. And sorry, don't no. use sodium valproate. Very dangerous stuff. Okay. Okay, so that should not, this is a treatment for bipolar disorder that should not be prescribed to women of childbearing age at all. It's the only medication where I would say absolute no, no. The only, okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, is a pretty universal question. Uh, <laughs> how can we get the attention of politicians regarding the importance of this issue? Where what secrets gone? can you share? Are they both gone? <laughs> you, know, see, you have no secrets for us. <laughs> then, then I'll yes, yeah, okay. yes. Well, I, was, I had a, a meeting last week with the Minister of Health and our Minister for Children and Families on the 1001 Days. Uh, in the UK, uh, and they declared a strong commitment. Um, our royal family is getting involved in pushing our politicians, so it needs help from the, the very top. Um, the evidence helps, but the stories of women who have not had good experiences and who've had good experiences and of their children are as valuable, if not more valuable, than the science. So I would say if you want the attention of politicians, if you want to campaign, you need, as I showed on my slide, every organization in Iceland working together, children's organizations, mental health organizations, all of them working together with women and families with experiences of this, with stories to tell, with the science. You combine those and it's a killer combination. There they can't resist it. And with that, we say thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you.
Now we will um, we'll be offering our morning refreshments outside the auditorium, and we'll start the program uh, again 10 minutes past 10. We're running a very strict schedule, so I will start at 10 minutes after 10. I'd like to remind you to keep your eye on, on Slido. Uh, questions and, and polls. And for those of you at home, please uh, have a nice coffee and we'll see you in 10 minutes. 20 minutes, excuse me, 10 minutes after 10. Going to get things going. Welcome back in. I hope you enjoyed the coffee. Welcome back, people online. Uh, I'll ask you again to um, turn off your phones. And we're going to get started. Now I'd like to introduce, I'd like to ask people to please, uh, maybe, maybe I could get a little assistance calling people in and quieting and settling. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce our second keynote speaker, Mette Weiver, um, Dr. Mette Weiver. And now Dr. Weiver is a professor, a professor of clinical child psychology and early intervention and the directorate, uh, director of the Center for Early Intervention and Family Studies at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, her keynote address today is entitled Understanding Babies, Translating Early Childhood Research into Practice. Welcome, Dr. Ave. Thank you very much, and thank you for, to the organizers for inviting me to talk here today. It's very nice to be here in Iceland. Uh, and I also would like to congratulate the, the group working uh, within this project with the very nice three reports that so far has been the outcome of the project. Uh, these are very nice reports uh, and very helpful, I think, for all of us working within this area. So uh, in that sense, I think the project has been a big success so far. Uh, and I really do hope that it will continue somehow this collaboration uh, between the Nordic countries. Uh, so it's an honor for me here to be here today and to be talking a little bit about uh, what we do in Denmark. Um, and the title of my talk is called Understanding Babies, Translating Early Childhood Research into Practice. Uh, and as you all know, um, within this area, we have a lot of shortenings. Uh, so uh, I'll try to get through those shortenings that are listed here. Uh, first of all, CIF stands for the Center for Early Intervention and Family Studies. That's where I come from. Uh, here we aim to promote early childhood mental health. Uh, we focus on parenting skills and the qualification of frontline staff working with uh, zero to six year old children already from pregnancy. We have a special focus on promoting the quality of the caregiver relationships that uh, the child de develops within. Uh, and we do this both in the home setting and in the family, se uh, in the home setting and in the daycare setting. Um, the other shortenings uh, that I would uh, hopeful, hope that you will be able to say afterwards is the Copenhagen Infant Mental Health Project that I'll be talking about. It's the uh, uh, measurement called Alarm Distress Baby Scale. Then it is the Circle of Security Parenting Intervention. And then finally, it's the Understanding Your Baby Intervention, which I will only shortly be mentioning in my talk. Um, within this area, we're very lucky to have a very clear definition of what we actually understand by uh, early childhood mental health. Uh, from the diagnostic system called zero to three, or now zero to five. And it states that early childhood mental health is the developing capacity of the young child to experience, regulate, and express emotions, 
to form close and secure interpersonal relationships and to explore and master the environment and learn. And all this goes on in the context of the family, community and cultural expectations for young children. So uh, central or buzzwords are of course emotions, uh, it's the relationships uh, and it's exploring and learning. Um, we also know from the many years of empirical attachment research that infant attachment is a key factor for child mental health. We know that within the early attachment uh, relationships, the child develops emotion and stress regulation capacities that are very important for the child's ongoing development. We also know that secure attachment predicts social competence, self-esteem and resilience. We find kids who are curious and eager to play and to learn. And we also know that insecure and disorganized attachment are risk factors, especially, of course, the disorganized uh, attachment style is a risk factor for later emotional and behavioral pro uh, problems. And we do have a lot of evidence now uh, pointing to this. So this is just to illustrate uh, the typical distribution of attachment patterns in a typical Western population. Uh, we find, of course, and luckily you could say that the majority of children are securely attached, but we do also find in a typical population a large number of insecurely attached kids and also disorganized attached kids. And it's quite a large number, you can say, within a typical population. So, uh, and that I think actually also then answers the question on my next slide that it is important that we, with working within this field, start to translate the evidence from early childhood research into practice and that we help each other doing that and evaluating that in a systematic way. In Denmark, we have just published uh, a report where we've looked at the mental health in the young children of zero to nine year old. Uh, and we find that 16% of these kids experience some kind of mental problems. Around the age of 10 years, 8% of these kids will have at least one psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, and my guess would be that it would be the same uh, in your countries. So we know by now that mental health problems start early. They may be caused by inborn problems in the child or insufficient caregiving uh, environments. Uh, and they may have li lifelong consequences for the child. Uh, but I think all of us here today can agree that children at risk are identified too late, the preventive interventions are initiated too late, and we don't know at this point enough about their efficiency. So that was actually sort of what uh, started or set the background. And here I can also thank you uh, for your talk because you talked a lot about postpartum depression as a risk factor, which is very nice because that is one of the risk factors that we are actually looking into in the project that I will be talking about now uh, called the Copenhagen Infant Mental Health Project. Uh, and that was a project that we started and were able to start in 2015 uh, based on two grants from a charity foundation in Denmark called the Troik Foundation. And the project ran from 15 and until 20. The overall aim of uh, the KIMP project, as we call it in short, uh, is to promote the mental well-being of the young infants and also the relationships between infants and their parents. And in the project, as you can see from the title, we collaborated with the municipality of Copenhagen and especially the health visitors in Copenhagen city, uh, but also the Copenhagen Council Department for Children and Youth. First of all, what we really also wanted to do initially with the Copenhagen Infant Mental Health Project was to put infant social emotional development on the agenda in primary care in Denmark. Um, so, first of all, we established a dialogue and a collaboration with the health visitors uh, in Copenhagen. But as you all know from the reports uh, that have been published as an outcome of this project, we have a quite uh, large and well-developed system in Denmark of a home visiting program. 
Uh, however, you could say that especially the social emotional development of the child in the home visiting program has been kept more under an informal surveillance than, for example, measuring the baby, weighing the baby, speaking of uh, eating habits, sleeping habits, and so on. Uh, and there has not been a tradition of using systematic or standardized uh, instruments for actually uh, assessing uh, infant mental health during the first year and during the home visit. Uh, so you could say that the sort of the evaluation that the health visitors are expected to do of mental health has been very much based on their clinical experience with kids, but also on what you could call their gut feeling of whether this was a kid that they should be worried about or not. Uh, so this led to in this program that we introduced and had a dialogue with the health visitors about the feasibility of using the instrument called the Alarm Distress Baby Scale, which is developed by uh, Professor Kidney from France, uh, which is a tool for systematic observation and identification of persistent social withdrawal in young infants, uh, which is an indicator of social emotional distress in infants and young children. And we know from a number of studies that exactly socio-emotional or social withdrawal of the young infant is a serious risk factor for long-term development of the child. I will not go into details in describing the ADBB instrument, which is actually also one of the instruments that has been evaluated in the report coming out from this project uh, regarding its psychometric uh, strengths. Um, and it, I think, was a level three, uh, which, of course, is very nice. Um, so the ADBB is an observational tool, uh, which uh, the health visitor, so it's the health visitor or another professional having the baby in her or his hands, doing an observation of these eight behavioral items, which sort of are key items of infant social contact. These items are scored. Uh, and then you sort of compile them into a complete or a overall score in the end. Um, the items are described in a manual um, and you have to be trained in using the ADBB and you also have to go through a certification uh, exam to actually document that you can use the ADBB in a valid and reliable way so that we can actually uh, be sure that we see the same when we see an infant. Uh, it's really important to notice that social withdrawal is an alarm signal. It's not a diagnosis. Uh, and it can be caused by something inborn in the child. It could also be somatic conditions. And it could, of course, also be related to the caregiving environment of the child. So overall, uh, these are the aims for uh, the project, we wanted to develop a training program and we wanted to train the 250 health visitors in the municipality of Copenhagen in using the, the alarm distress baby scale. We wanted to evaluate the implementation, that is the feasibility and acceptability of the health visitors in using the ADBB. And we wanted to conduct Danish validations of the ADBB. Furthermore, and I'll be not be talking about that today, we also wanted to do a Danish validation of the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, which has actually, until we did it, never been validated in a Danish context, but it has been used for many years. So uh, that's, I guess, how life is. Uh, but now we do have a validated version in Denmark. Um, then I will also be talking about, and I will present some preliminary findings uh, of our uh, effect study of the circle of security parenting intervention. Um, so as you all know, you shouldn't start uh, identifying early risk factors if you can't offer anything for those that you identify. Uh, so this was what the families was offered. Uh, either they were, they were randomized two to one into either circle of security parenting or care as usual in the city of Copenhagen if the mothers fulfilled uh, uh, the criteria for postpartum depression, which was diagnosed through a clinical interview and all the infants scored above the cutoff uh, on the social 
um, on the alarm distress baby scale. So first of all, uh, in regard to evaluating the implementation of the alarm distress baby scale in primary care, uh, we uh, used data from the first almost 80 health visitors that were trained and certified in using it. And what we found was, of course, not surprising, but of course important, is that prevalence rates, uh, screening prevalence rates increased during the first year. When we looked six months after they started using the ADBB, we found that almost half of the kids that they had had in their hands had an ADBB score. But 12 months after implementation, it was almost 80 of the kids, which I think is a very, very nice uh, screening prevalence um, when we are introducing a new measure uh, and a new method uh, in the practice of primary care. We also did some qualitative analysis, and uh, you can look the paper up if you want to have the details. But the majority of the health visitors reported the ADBB to make a positive contribution to their uh, practice, but however, 80% also experienced it to be a challenge. And it was also, of course, interesting to see that it was the, uh, age, uh, the health visitors' attitude towards using the ADBB instrument that actually also predicted the screening prevalence after one year. Uh, furthermore, we wanted, of course, to look at the psychometric uh, properties of the ADBB when used in a Danish context, and we are not finished by doing that. We have published the first paper where we have looked at the construct validity using item response theory of the ADBB, and we had quite a large sample of infants. We had almost 25,000 infants between the age of zero to one year, uh, and we found that the ADBB showed overall several psychometric strengths, uh, and also that the items showed good discriminatory uh, abilities. So this is, uh, I would say, my success slide. Um, normally in research you don't have many of those, and the rest of them that I will be showing you are not that successful, but this is my success slide. Uh, and you, as you can see, most of Denmark is actually green. Uh, and this indicates that uh, the ADBB now is implemented in almost, yeah, well, in the autumn it'll be 80 out of the 98 Danish municipalities. Uh, and I think it's important to say that it has been driven by the health visitors themselves in each of the municipalities. It's been something that they heard about and that they also wanted. Um, and um, I think what is really important to state here, because that was also something stated in the report coming out from this project, that what we really lack, at least in Denmark, but it looked like it was across the Nordic countries, are actually uh, a solid data infrastructure during the first years of life. Uh, so that means that in Denmark, we actually don't have systematic and standardized data on the kids from zero to five. Uh, it's sort of a black land. I don't know if you could say that in English, but we say it in Danish. Um, so we don't have any sort of solid data to look at when we want to look at mental health and when we want to look at uh, what is actually predicting later development. So uh, you have in the different municipalities, you have different measures, but this is actually becoming an almost national measure, which I think is really nice. Uh, just shortly mentioning, I'll be going more details with this in the workshop uh, this afternoon, uh, but based on our collaboration with the health visitors, they explained to us that they really would like to use the alarm distress baby scale observation that they're now doing uh, at the home visits with the young, <coughs> with the young kids. Uh, they would use that situation to actually, in a more systematic way, share knowledge about the early social-emotional development of the child, because it's a unique situation where you have the baby in your hand and you're looking after specific behaviors, and so it constitutes a very, very nice situation where you can share knowledge with the parent. And that led us to develop uh, a new program called Understanding Your Baby, and if you don't know about our videos, I really would suggest that you go there and look at them. They have English subtitles, and we are very proud of them. Uh, they are accessible for all and can be used by all. Um, 
but that's something um, that I'll be talking more about in the workshop. So now I have time to talk about <coughs> testing the efficacy of the Circle of Security Parenting Program. I'm sure that many of you maybe already work with the COSP or you've heard about the COSP program. So I will not go into details about explaining the program. It's American developed. It focuses on uh, promoting parental sensitivity, mentalizing and secure attachments. In our project, it was delivered to groups of parents. Both the moms and their partners were invited to participate. And as you remember, it was either postpartum depression or infant social withdrawal that they were included on. It was delivered as 10 weekly sessions uh, delivered at our center at the university. And we offered babysitting while the parents attended the group. Um, so we would have liked to include more in the RCT, uh, but at some point the municipality of Copenhagen started using COSP in the care as usual group. So as you all know, then the RCT is done. Um, because when we phoned up and asked them, so what have you received from the, from the municipality of Copenhagen? They said, oh, but this lady came and she showed me this very nice circle. Okay, so it was done. Um, we randomized two to one into COSP because it was a group format uh, so that the parents didn't have to wait too long to get the treatment or the intervention. The comp we had quite a, uh, some dropouts, especially in the care as usual group, but we ended up with these final cases, uh, 167 in COSP and 69 in care as usual. Uh, I'll shortly mention to you the preliminary results uh, on the main outcomes that we have specified in our uh, protocol paper. Uh, first, our primary outcome is maternal sensitivity. Uh, we have used the observational measure called coding interactive behavior, developed by Ruth Feldman. Uh, and we did it both at baseline, uh, when the families were included, and we did it again at follow-up. Uh, again, here now, I'm only focusing on the maternal uh, outcomes. Uh, secondary outcomes, uh, we looked at maternal reflective functioning, and we did that both at baseline and follow-up again. Uh, we have used uh, the questionnaire called Parental Reflective Functioning Questionnaire, which has been developed by uh, Patrick Leuten and his group. And then we uh, did strange situations with all these kids, we have had them coded and coded reliability with international recognized coders. It's been an enormous <laughs> job, I can just say that. Uh, anyways, uh, we couldn't of course do uh, the strange situation at baseline because the kids were too young. Uh, so we only have of course the attachment at uh, the follow-up measure. So this is just to show you, and I'll not go into details with it, to show you our sample. Uh, because you could say that, of course, it is an at-risk sample. You see that uh, um, the majority have been included due to depression in both groups, a much smaller number due to social withdrawal and or depression. Uh, so it is, in largely speaking, a depressed sample. Um, but you could also say that even though, and please remember that this is not just based on EPDS scores, these are really moms that are depressed because it's based on the SCID interview. So it's a diagnostic, uh, diagnosed uh, postpartum depression. But you could also say that they are, you know, the majority of them are highly educated in both groups. They, most of them were employed. Most of them were in relationships. Um, so again, it is an at-risk sample but we have a number of protective factors in this sample as well. If we look at our scores uh, at baseline, you see that at maternal sensitivity and follow-up, uh, you can see that there's not much different, but the, ma the, uh, the maximum score on the system that we have used is five. So you can see that they are already very high at baseline. Um, so that's, of course, a problem. It goes for both groups. We have no differences between the group in any of these things. Maternal reflective functioning. Here you have uh, three 
you have three um, scales. You want the first one to be rather low. You want the middle one to be mid-range, and you want the last one to be high, and the highest score is seven. Uh, so again, you can see that they're already pretty much doing a good job in that sense in both groups. Um, and then attachment style. Here you can see in both groups that we have quite, quite a different distribution when we compare it to the circle that I showed you of a typical distribution. We have only 2.7% uh, in the cost P group and 36 uh, in the uh, cash usual group being avoidant, which is really, really, uh, how do you say it, non-typical. Um, and then we have, of course, quite a large percentage of secure, but we also have a, quite a large percentage of disorganized kids in the group. Got, that's Danish for good. Uh, preliminary uh, results. These are the complete case analysis. Um, so, as you can see, this project has taken me seven years. No effects of cost P. That's just the short message. Uh, no effects on maternal sensitivity, no effects on reflective functioning, and also no effects on child attachment. So uh, that is sort of the short uh, message. We have also analyzed these outcomes with treatment as given. Uh, that changed nothing. So, um, you know, we would have liked to have included more. So you can say, as we always say in RCT studies, we may have limited statistical power. So we will, of course, conduct more analysis we will impute uh, missing data and, and do analysis that way. We'll also be looking more detailed into um, uh, the null finding using Bayesian analysis. But I think there are also quite another points that can be, uh, there are many points that can be discussed here. Um, but I just highlighted some of them here. Um, we have highly sensitive mothers already from baseline. So you could say it's really hard to make good mothers even better, and maybe we shouldn't bother. Uh, I mean, they're already doing a good job, so we may also have a ceiling effect, of course, in our data. Um, but I think we must, you know, be honest and say that it is, this is an at-risk sample for postpartum depression, mainly. But I think we, based on this study, must say that COSP is not effective for postpartum depression. Uh, and actually, there's just been another recent study by Simmer Gembeck and all. Uh, they actually state, they looked at other risk factors, and they actually state in their paper that maybe COSP is not a program suited for at-risk families at all. So now I'm just throwing the bomb here. <laughs> no, I don't know if I am, but I think it's really, this is important knowledge. So in that sense, when I've sort of, you know, swallowed the fact that there were no effects of anything, uh, I sort of thought, oh, this is important anyway. This is really important because I know that cost P is used widely across the world. So I think it is important that we do these studies to actually find out where does it work and where doesn't it not work. Uh, and of course, we will be looking into moderators and mediators of outcome, what works for whom. Uh, for example, Cassidy in her study, using the cost P, she did find a small effect for off the cost P, she find fewer unsupported, but not more supportive maternal responses to child distress. And she also found that that effect was actually moderated by the mother's own attachment style and by her depressive symptoms. And that is, of course, something that we will be looking into as well. We will be looking into if we can find any lower sensitive mothers, did they actually progress? What about the socially withdrawn kids? Did their parents profit more there? So we will try and look uh, and disentangle the results in more detail. Uh, so this is my final slide. Uh, I really would like us in Denmark to have a national strategy for early childhood mental health, zero to six. 
And if it could be aligned, which I think is very reasonable uh, with the Nordic sort of overall strategy, that would be great. Um, and I would, of course, like my center to be a central part in that uh, thing. So I think the early identification of children at risk is really important. We need to upskill uh, frontline staff in the use of systematic and validated uh, instruments in all the developmental contexts that the young kids uh, are developing in. Uh, so that means we also need to look at the pedagogues in the daycare centers. Uh, we should, of course, focus more on universal mental health promotion programs, and we should also implement early preventive intervention programs. We should promote overall parenting skills, sharing knowledge with parents about this. As we talked about, this should be knowledge that is common sense to everybody. And really important is uh, this point that we need to strengthen the research and the systematic evaluations of the things that we do. Um, because I think if I had just asked the moms who had participated, participated in COSP in our project, they said, you know, this was great. Thank you. I re it really helped me. And I would have been, yes. Uh, so we need to do these tough works where we actually do RCTs and find out, does it work? And then, of course, we should ask, who does it work for and who does it not work for? And is it, of course, is it cost effective? That's another question that is important. So that was the final Thank word. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much, Mede. Now, for a few questions that have rolled in on Slido. Um, Mette, would you agree that it's uh, not only family and uh, at-risk families that provide um, unsecure attachment, but also wealthy families? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, risk factors can be everywhere. Uh, and also, you know, it's very difficult to state who is at risk and who's not at risk. So we are talking about complicated interactions in the young years between parental risk and infant risk, inborn risk in the infant. So I think there's a lot that we have to learn uh, and know more about. But of course, and that's also actually what the health visitors have explained to us, uh, is that the alarm distress baby scale is actually an instrument that has helped them to focus on the social emotional uh, development of the infant in every family, mm -hmm. not just where you have sort of the usual suspects when you come in and, you know, the alarm bells start, uh, but you actually do set aside time where you focus on the emotional development and the social contact of the infant in all families. Right. That leads into the next question. One of our, one of our respondents here wanted to know, how long do you think an ideal parental leave would be and should it include things like uh, information, education for parents or, and whatnot? What should those things be? Oh my God, don't get me started. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll just say my neighbor, he's a, a tom, atomic physicist or something, and I met him uh, the other day on the stairway and he said he just got 1.5 billions for doing research. And I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, this area is highly under-resourced and we could do so many good things if, uh, you know, if we could get the message out or, you know. Um, so, uh, what the best length of m parental leave is, I'm not sure that I have the answer for that, but what uh, many of the parents who, uh, and especially the fathers who participated in the Cost Peak program told us, was one of the guys said, you know, this is something that every parent should have. And if we move away from thinking as cost P as a thing that we should use with at-risk families, I think we can actually think of it as something that every family could profit from. Uh, and I think we should start already from pregnancy, of mm -hmm. course. I completely agree. I know the, the higher up I go on the, on the pay scale, the more stressed I am. It's a good thing my babies were born earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, next question. Um, are you looking at mother-child uh, attachments? What about when parents do not live together and the child has two homes, and how does this affect those attachments? 
Yeah, so, you know, there are always limitations in what you can do in research and with the instruments that you use. So the strain situation, as you know, you uh, can use that with the youngest kids and you only can assess that relationship to that caregiver who's part of the strain situation. Uh, so again, if I had, you know, all the resources that I wanted, I would have liked to have the, the fathers or the partners. We did have a very, some few rainbow families in our study as well. Um, so I would have loved to do strange situation with those parents as well, mm -hmm. uh, but the money wasn't there. No. Yeah. And I wonder also, I mean, just if you don't mind me stealing the stage here, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to uh, families of multi-ethnic backgrounds where there is a, a much larger familial um, cooperation, uh, there were aunts and uncles and, and grandparents and all kinds of um, miscellaneous attachments that sometimes step in for that, what we mm -hmm. would consider to be traditional mother-father, how that would affect. Any yes, thoughts? and again, I have to say there are a lot of limitations in this study because one of our inclusion criteria was actually that the parents were able to speak Danish. So, you know, we already cut away a large group of mm -hmm. parents there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, uh, let me see. Uh, what is the role of family and uh, physicians in identifying child mental problems? Do they have enough training during their studies? No. <laughs> <laughs> if I may say so. Um, so I think, uh, actually, we do uh, the ADBB trainings at uh, our center, and we do have a lot of different professionals coming for training, uh, also medical doctors, and, uh, and, that's, and I think that is really nice. Uh, I think we have a big challenge in Denmark because we have, um, you know, the family doctor system. I'm sure that you have that in the other Nordic countries as well. Um, and these, uh, these guys are really difficult to engage in research because uh, those clinics are run like, you know, their little businesses or how to, you know, so it's actually quite difficult. I find it quite mm. difficult. Uh, maybe I'm, I've not done my work good enough. Um, but actually they see the infants quite a lot of times at these regular child assessments. So they would be so wonderful if we could oops, sorry, work more closely with those guys. Okay, uh, sort of on the, on the line of, of professionals, um, are the, excuse me, are there risk, is there a risk that the uh, connection when health visitor will suffer from a more systemic screening? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so actually if you go and read the paper that we have published on how the health visitors have experienced the feasibility and acceptability of using the ADBB, uh, some of them point to the fact mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it can create a negative atmosphere uh, when they say that they will test the baby. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, uh, I think it's a lot about wording because what the health visitors always also say is that um, it has made the communication with the parents much stronger and it has made them much more uh, secure in actually starting up what you could call a more difficult dialogue uh, due to a worry because uh, their language has, uh, it's, they have a much bigger language and they're able to make it very, very concrete, the worry that they have about the child. Mm. So even though um, that, of course, and you're not expected to use numbers, of course, when you use the alarm distress baby scale, you're expected to use the qualitative wording of what you see uh, and share that with the parents. Mm -hmm. um, so I, in my personal view, uh, the, the gains are bigger than the risks. Right. Thank you for that. And then our final question, do you have any thoughts about why cost P uh, might not be effective for at-risk families or why cost P is not effective for postpartum depression? Uh, I think postpartum, you know, it's really important for me to say that we actually encourage the mothers who had postpartum depression to have other treatment on the side. 
So a number of them had medication, they went to psychologists to receive cognitive therapy, and because we knew that COSP does not focus on the depressive symptoms in itself, but the reason why we chose to do it was because we know that there's not necessarily a spillover effect from treating the maternal depression to the relationship. Um, but actually, especially one of the fathers uh, said that he, in his mind, there was too little focus on the depressive, on the depression within COSP. And of course, yes. Um, so in that sense, I think it's really important to be aware uh, that COSP does not focus on the depression. Uh, and that is, of course, a limitation. Um, but I would also say, uh, and those you, of you guys that work with COSP also know that um, it takes quite a mentalizing ability already from the beginning to be able as a parent to profit from COSP. Because you see these standardized videos in a group setting, and then you expect it to go home and change your behavior with the kids. So, you know, in my mind, I think if we are talking about at-risk families, I would choose something more intensive and more one-to-one, -one, also based on individual video feedback, as, for example, the video-informed positive parenting sensitive discipline program called vip -SD. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your investment Thank you. In, this, in this field. In a post-COVID world, it's not possible to hold a conference without having at least one Zoom presentation. Now, please welcome Dr. Kari uh, Slinning, uh, who will be joining us online via Zoom. Um, who is, he's the head of uh, the Division for Infants and uh, Young Children at the Regional Center for Child and Adolescent Mental Health in Norway. Kari has one of the uh, collaborating partners uh, in the Nordic Thousand Days project, and she, excuse me, will be talking about the lessons learned during the course of the project in her talk. Uh, what is it we can do alone? The added value of, of Nordic collaboration. Welcome, Dr. Kari Selling. Thank you for your kind introduction and for the invitation to share some thoughts and ideas about the added value of Nordic collaboration. I must say I'm so sorry I can't be there with you today. But you know, strikes and flight cancellations are out of my control. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this project group, the first thousand days in the Nordic countries. As you have heard earlier today, the members are mainly representatives from the Nordic health directorates. I'm not. We have been two representatives from one of the four regional centers of child and adolescent mental health in Norway, Arbub Östersør, Gunmette Rösan, and myself. I will now take a couple of minutes to tell you where in the public health system our regional centers are organized. A bit about my background and the National Network for Infant Mental Health in Norway, since this is highly relevant for my talk here today. From this organization map, you can see that the four regional centers are at level three from the top of the system, the green boxes. On the top level, we have the Ministry of Health and Care and Ministry of Children and Families. At level two, we have the Norwegian Directorate of Health and the Directorate for Children, Youth and Family Affairs. The national network are founded by these two directorates. Every year since 2006, the annual grant letter from these two directorates have highlighted that our centers should put extra effort into assuring evidence-based practice in all services relevant for perinatal and infant mental health shown in the yellow boxes at the lowest level. Today, we are about 30 clinicians and researchers with multi-professional background from these four centers who are engaged in this mission. Together we form a national network for infant mental health, shown in the pink color box. 
As head of the Department of Infant and Young Children with about 30 years of experience in this particular field, I now have the responsibility for coordinating the network. And we have a steering group with one representative from each of the four regional centers. At Arbu, I lead a research team and a group of experienced clinicians who provide teaching and supervision of health practitioners in all services relevant for perinatal and infant mental health. Another national network has developed a national strategy with specific short and long-term goals to guide us in this work. Our mission is to support the services relevant for perinatal and infant mental health. We advise and collaborate with leaders and, and employees to develop high quality services. We conduct applied research and systematic reviews, and we provide postgraduate supplementary training and education. And now a quick reminder of the lessons learned from this project by looking at some significant strengths and weaknesses before I share with you how our Nordic countries can benefit from working more closely together to build upon these strengths and reduce the weaknesses. As you have heard earlier today, the Nordic countries have very important strengths when it comes to supporting a healthy start in life. We have free health care and social service, high participation in prenatal care and infant and child health care, growing emphasis on mental health and supporting the parent-child relationship, substantial parental leave and universal access to early childhood education and care. But now, take a look at these numbers. New families in our Nordic countries have an average of 22 consultations with medical staff and health practi practitioners from early pregnancy to the infant reaches two years of age. I repeat, at average 22 single opportunities to support healthy development and good mental health for all, to identify parents and infants at risk and provide early and effective intervention. And not to forget that every, that the majority of our infants spend five days a week in daycare from the age of one. What a great opportunity for early intervention. However, we know from the clinic that we overlook too many and that the support and help we provide may not be as effective as we would like. So here are some of the reasons for why we don't succeed. Firstly, we have heard that there is a high variations in how procedures and routines are implemented in the services. Secondly, there exist few well-documented interventions for young infants and families. And lastly, the services don't have readily available access to evidence-based methods that are delivered with comprehensive training, supervision, and implementation plan. Now, let's take a closer look at each of the three weaknesses. Every country has national guidelines for structure, routines, and content for the different services. But there is no efficient system that documents to what degree these guidelines are followed by the services. Our experiences indicated that there is an, an acceptable degree of variations in procedures and routines for identification and responding to risk factors, both within and between services in each country and across our countries. We do need recording and monitoring of practice. One example from our Norwegian guideline for prenatal care. It is recommended to ask pregnant women about current and previous mental health problems, but little is written regarding how to do it or when to do it. This leads to great variety. More clear recommendations from the health authorities regarding use of evidence-based screening tools and interventions and better standardization would reduce inequalities in the services, increased opportunities to monitor the health of infants and parents, 
and to compare data across services, both within and across our countries. So to the second weakness, we have learned from this project that a large number of interventions and assessment instruments are available for parents and young children in the Nordic countries. But evidence on their effectiveness and psychometric properties are often lacking or insufficient. You've seen this number earlier today, but I repeat again because they're so important. So if we take a look at the screening and assessment tools reviewed, we can see that 12% were rated at level one, indicating lowest scientific level, and 12% at level four, indicating highest scientific level. And with the vast majority, 61% receiving a rating at level two, with some, but inadequate level of quality. One obvious weakness is that many tools are developed in countries outside the Nordic region, and because there are few validation studies conducted in our own culture, and we lack Nordic norms. And of the 63 unique psychosocial interventions reviewed, more than half were rated at level one, indicated no or low quality evidence, and only 3% at level four, indicating a high quality of evidence. But note, the lack of evidence does not necessarily mean that the intervention does not work. This, ca this can be the case, but another explanation is that effectiveness is not known because there is no or little quality research available. To obtain high grading, the finding must be both robust and at least one study conducted in a Nordic country for cultural relevance. To our knowledge, the interventions with good or strong evidence are not more widely spread than interventions with less evidence. This is the case, even though we have available databases for the services, where service leaders and health practitioners can get information about the evidence level of interventions and tests. Thus, it is important to bring awareness about these databases and that the dissemination of available evidence-based tests and interventions receive more consistent and systematic support. And this is the third area of weaknesses that we have to do something about. In general, the Nordic countries lack formalized services funded by the health authorities responsible for training, implementation, and dissemination of available evidence-based methods. I'm referring to top-down anchoring now. As of today, training is often offered from private companies or individuals who are very skilled and committed clinicians. However, they often lack a rig and resources to follow up and further develop the training program and offer guidance and skills training. We need to take this seriously because evidence-based intervention without high quality implementation have proven to have zero to negative effects. The method is only as good as the person using it. And now to the question, how do we in an efficient manner reduce the variation in procedures and routines of the services? Increase the number of available evidence-based methods, tests, as well as interventions and make available standardized training and full-scale implementation programs. My answer to this question is not by five separate plans made by the health authorities in each of our Nordic countries, but by continuing the collaboration between the partners in this project and develop a Nordic strategic plan for perinatal and infant mental health with stable funding. This is where the real work begins. We need power to move forward fast, and therefore we need each other. So let's look at what structure and resources that need to be in place to do so. As I showed you on one of my first slides, Norway has the RIG, a national network for perinatal and infant mental health, with researchers and clinicians specialized in perinatal and infant mental health. We have stable funding from the Norwegian Health Directorate 
and the Directorate for Children, Youth and Family Affairs. We put much effort to support the services, reducing the weaknesses I have talked about. We have gained a lot of valuable experiences over these 16 years about how to do it. But we need more resources and capacity to move forward faster. There are relatively few opportunities to apply for research funding in Norway, and the competition is high, so it is all so it often takes many years of application rounds before we succeed with funding. So here is my vision for the years to come. By establishing a robust structure for Nordic collaboration, a Nordic strategic plan and predictable funding, we, will, we could together work systematically to reach the overall aim to support healthy emotional development and good mental health during the first thousand days. It is my view that a good starting point is that each country would have a national network for prenatal and infant mental health with similar organization, sorry, uh, and funding as Norwegian network for infant mental health. The networks illustrated here by the green boxes must consist of both researchers and clinicians in order to build a bridge for effective implementation of new knowledge into the practice field. And we will need effective feedback loops from the health practitioners in the services back to the researchers. The next step is to establish a Nordic network for perinatal and infant mental health with representatives from each of these national networks. The Nordic network would develop a strategic plan with short and long-term goals in agreement with the national directors from the five countries. And we would of course need a Nordic research program for prenatal and infant mental health, where we together could apply for research grants to conduct solid Nordic studies. With a Nordic network, we will be able to recommend more standardized procedures and routines to conduct Nordic research of high quality and do standardized training and implementation and make it more available for all the services. Here are some examples of standardized routines that we could give. Common procedures for when to screen and an agreement of best time points to screen, and common routines for data registration. There are many benefits of a Nordic research collaboration. We will have more cultural specific knowledge. The majority of evidence-based tests and interventions we use are developed and tested in countries outside the Nordic region, many in the US. There are often large costs associated with learning the methods and becoming trainers and supervisors. We also have little freedom to make any changes or develop the methods further based on experiences we gain by using the methods. In many cases, we have to pay a yearly license for use or for recertification. By a strong Nordic research collaboration, we can develop and test our own methods and be become more independent. Multi-site studies across the Nordic countries will give bigger, wiser, and stronger research teams. We will have larger sample sites, which will give more robust data sets and findings. We will reduce recruitment time particularly the case in clinical trials with patients and high-risk groups, which is so difficult to recruit. It will be easier to do comprehensive studies that combine effectiveness studies with subgroup analysis, implementation research, and cost-effectiveness analysis. We need more equal access to services that deliver high quality, faster, and more effective interventions. Thus, we need a public system or service that provides regular skills development, professional guidance, and high-quality staff training on evidence-based practices. Only by this way, we will have easily available, 
predictable and quality assured training to a low cost. The nice thing is that we will not start at zero. We already have several Nordic associations and organizations in our field, such as the Nordic Association for Infant Mental Health, the Nordic Merce Society, and the Nordic Attachment Network. These associations are important meeting arenas for clinicians and researchers in our field. And as you can see from the pink colored boxes, there are also some bottom-up initiatives where small groups of Nordic researchers and clinicians specialized in specific methods meet regularly to share experiences and develop common procedures for training and implementations. So my dream for the future is that we will succeed to establish a strong Nordic research collaboration and a Nordic network. That early detection of risk factor is done in a systematic and caring manner by use of validated screening and assessment tools at predefined time points. That we have a quality assurance system that guarantees the same level of quality in all services that we have well-defined and available stepped care services that deliver effective interventions, that we record and monitor progress, and that we have standardized and easily available training with regular maintenance and supervision for all recommended methods in the field. The fact that the partners in these projects are the health directorates makes it very promising for the future of this field. As we have heard here today, there are many lessons learned from this project. And my expectations now are that our Nordic health authorities will decide to continue the good collaboration. It is now the real work begins to ensure a good start for every new child and their parents in our Nordic countries. I'm prepared to collaborate with you all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Snilling. Um, due to the nature of, of, of her um, presentation, there will be no questions. Uh, we won't be taking question time, but there it will be a new poll on your Slido related to, her, to hers. So please be active. And now um, we have our final speaker for this morning, and I'm very honored to uh, welcome Dr. John Levis, Director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center for Evidence-Informed Policy, and the Director of McMaster University's Health Forum in Otar Ontar Ontario, Canada. I'm so stuck between languages, excuse me, Ontario, I can say the word. <laughs> Uh, his talk is focused on how to make change happen and bridging the gap between evidence and policy. Please welcome Dr. John Lavis. Thank you very much to Sigrid and her colleagues uh, for inviting me to Iceland and also to Petra and her colleagues from the Itla Children's Foundation for making the connection. Uh, uh, my parents would tell me, uh, have told me many times I'm not a funny person, so you'll be relieved that I'm followed by a comedian. Uh, and, I, and I have watched his uh, Netflix special, and it's superb. Um, we've spent uh, a lot of the last uh, 15 months uh, working on the Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Challenges, and some of what I'm going to say draws on this. Um, we started the work on the Evidence Commission 12 months into supporting the COVID evidence response, uh, where we were seeing extraordinary innovations, ultra rapid syntheses, living evidence syntheses, uh, efforts to reduce the signal to noise ratio. Um, and the report is now out. It's available in seven languages. Um, and I'm going to draw on some of the key insights today. But the next few slides um, are going to be about how to bridge the gap between evidence and policy. Uh, there's going to be a couple of Slido uh, questions for you coming up. So these next few slides are to get you thinking about those questions that you'll be asked on Slido. 
So the writers of the report uh, emphasize very strongly that all of the recommendations are important. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to try to prioritize them. If you had to rank order them from most important to least important to move on in your country, uh, which ones would you put first? And I'm going to unpack uh, the six of them in a bit more detail so you know uh, a little bit more about them. The other question that I'm going to ask you is if you could only pick one bucket of activities to put your energies into, would it be helping parents to make choices, enabling local providers to learn and improve, or encouraging government to support both of those activities and do some of the things that only government can do? So if you had to pick, so we probably need all three, but if you had to pick one of those, where would you want the energy to come to? So those are the questions I'm going to ask you to uh, answer in Slido shortly. But a little bit more information. You've now heard about um, the work of the first uh, 1,000 Days Commission. Um, three reports. The first one pointing out some specific opportunities for improvement, but it also showcased the need for some additional work on screening instruments and evidence-based practices. So that led to the second report, and you just saw some very powerful slides uh, demonstrating that many of the tests being used and the psychosocial interventions being used um, don't have high quality supporting evidence or have very little evidence and more evidence is needed. So that led then to the final report with a number of big picture opportunities for improvement. And these are the six that I'm going to ask you to rank order. When I read those six, I think about very concrete things. So recognizing the importance of the first uh, thousand days, to me, one of the most important recommendations is every Nordic country should have an implementation plan for the report. Most reports go nowhere, they are not acted on. If governments don't have an implementation plan, that's likely a recipe for no action. Second, provide comprehensive support for parents in the first 1,000 days. And here, one of the opportunities uh, singled out is digital platforms. Third, identify and respond systematically to risk factors. And these are those assessments and the psychosocial interventions. And you saw in Alan's presentation that risk pyramid. And it, it went by so quickly, but that was such an important slide to think about putting parents and children in order of growing risk and barriers to accessing care, and those at the very top with the greatest needs and the greatest barriers to accessing care are going to need the most support, and their support might look different from people lower down the risk pyramid. So we would call that population health management. You might have different terms for, for it, but it's critically important to think about how to get the right assessments, the right services to the right people. The fourth recommendation, improve equity and quality in services. And you just saw an excellent presentation on ideas about how to do that. We need to monitor and we need to support learning and improvement systematically and at scale if we really want to get all of the right services to the people who need them. Fifth, improve cross-sectoral collaboration, and <clears throat> one of many areas where Nordic countries lead. You have child protection officers sitting with early education workers, social services providers, healthcare providers. But how do you get those different parts of the system making decisions together? And then finally, advance research, knowledge, and understanding, including for the research gaps identified in the review. So those are the six buckets, but also those underlying points from my perspective are some of the most important things to be thinking about. So if you're now going to be thinking about, well, what do we do? And remember, I think probably you need to be taking action in all three ways. But if you were going to tackle the first one, helping parents, how would you approach it? And one of the things that the Evidence Commission report speaks to is we can't keep wagging our finger at individuals in general, parents in particular, and saying, you need to improve your information literacy, you need to improve your digital literacy, and so on. We need to figure out how we embed evidence in everyday life. So the question for all of you is, where do parents now make choices, and where do they go for information to make choices about the range of issues involved in the first thousand days? 
And then are there ways to embed evidence into those? So my examples on this slide aren't specific to the first thousand days, but they're examples of making evidence the default function, making evidence-based choices the easier option, making evidence available to people when they're making choices, <coughs> helping people, <coughs> excuse me, judge what others are claiming. These are ways that we embed evidence into everyday life rather than develop a new standalone website in the hopes that people will go to it. But if we're gonna do this, then in every one of your countries, you need to have the right partners and you need to work with people who bring the right evidence, but also people who bring lived experience, parents and others, and people who bring behavioral insights, implementation researchers who can tell you about how to reach people effectively if you're going to deliver on the promise of this particular approach. Second approach is enable ongoing learning and improvement uh, to permit a range of issues that are under local control. Now, in the, Norwegian in the Norwegian presentation, there was talk of standardization, and for many countries, that might be appropriate. But often, there's a fair de degree of autonomy locally. But what would be the candidate issues we'd focus on? As we just heard in the last talk, those psycho psychological tests those psycho psychosocial interventions, but also how we think about that risk pyramid and array the right assessments and the right tests at the right level. The second question is, is there an opportunity to use learning and improvement cycles where groups can get experience with what this looks like, work with the priority population, segment that uh, population into groups with shared needs and shared barriers to accessing care, what it looks like for a set of newcomers to the country might look very different from other groups in the population. So how do you learn and improve about how to better reach them? Third, co-design these care models and the service mix. Fourth, implement the models in ways that ensure reach. If we're not reaching the people with the greatest needs, we're not going to have impact. Fifth, monitor and evaluate using an equity-sensitive quadruple aim approach, quadruple aim improving care experiences, health outcomes, keeping per capita costs manageable, and keeping providers engaged. And then adjust as needed and aim for scale in a way that ensures all children equitably benefit. And again, you heard this in the Norwegian presentation. If you're going down this path, then in your country, you need to be thinking about, do we have the coaches? Do we have the collaborative infrastructure to support that kind of learning and improvement? And then finally, respond in a timely way when a window of opportunity opens for government to pursue a meaty issue. It is very, very, very hard to influence government policymaking. And while the first thousand days are critically important, imagine all of the people, all of the groups, trying to get on government's agendas, trying to influence their decisions. So first think about what is the media issue or what are the media issues that you can advance now? Is it the implementation plan? Is it the digital platform? Is it the population health management model? Is it the learning and improvement infrastructure? So think about of everything that could be done, what are the candidate issues that you could move on in your country or as a set of Nordic countries working together? Then ask yourself the question, are we trying to get a new issue on the government agenda? If you want to, you have to keep in mind that politicians often need three things to take action. They need to be convinced there's a compelling problem. They need to be convinced there's a viable policy and the politics need to look right. And the politics change as governments come and go, as where they are in the electoral cycle changes, and you need to be attentive to that. Evidence can help with the problem um, and the policy piece. But once items are decided that the government is gonna take action, evidence can help again. It can help to clarify the problem and its causes. It can help to frame options. It can help with that implementation piece that makes sure whatever is decided reaches all the people who need to benefit from it. But then those politicians are working in a political world. They're working under institutional constraints. They're dealing with interest group pressures. They have their own values. Their constituents have values. And you're trying to get evidence into the mix with those teams. 
So if you're trying to influence governments, you ideally should be partnering with people in your country who have the capacity to put together innovative evidence products that are timely, that are driven by the interests of policymakers, that are contextualized to your political and welfare system, and that are equity sensitive. But they also need to be able to convene stakeholders, parents, different groups in society to talk about what should we do. Politicians will not just listen to the evidence. They also have to hear from stakeholders that this is a promising direction. So those are three approaches. And my question to each of you, if you, we can open the Slido poll, is first, of those six priorities, how would you rank order them? And then second, if you had to pick among the three approaches, which would you pick first? So if you go into Slido, you should see this coming up. Uh, while all of you are doing that, um, let me just go on to the, a couple of more general points from the Evidence Commission. One is we can't continue to respond to policymakers' questions as we did in many, many countries for the last 27 months with COVID with preprints. Preprints should be assessed for quality and slotted in with the available evidence, all the other studies addressing the same question. Squeaky wheel experts, very hard during COVID to know who to trust because very often experts spoke in a way that you weren't sure whether it was their personal opinion or the expert. Um, and old school expert panels, very rarely panels with people with lived experience, very rarely panels with pre-circulated evidence, lots of shortfalls. And we also relied on select forms of evidence, relying on data analytics, modeling, and evaluation, but forgetting about the behavioral and implementation research, forgetting about the high quality reviews and guidelines. So one of the recommendations, and from my perspective, the most important one uh, for all of us in our countries, for the first thousand days, but for all of the issues we face as society, we need to formalize and strengthen our country's evidence support system. So we have a research system that does research. We have an innovation system that supports R&D. We also need an evidence support system grounded in that country's political and welfare system, um, demand-driven, focused on contextualizing the evidence for a given decision in an equity-sensitive way. And that means a lot of infrastructure that most countries, certainly my own Canada, don't have. Uh, units that can combine the power of national evidence and global evidence. Expert panels that include people with lived experience. Uh, government science advisors who speak in a way that make it possible to judge their accuracy. And changes to a lot of our processes, including you shouldn't be able to get to the Minister of Finance and other places without bringing evidence to the table about what's being done. So a couple more slides that I'm going to skip over in the interest of the Slido results, but we need to match the form of evidence to the right step in the decision-making process. Big focus nowadays on big data, data analytics, helpful at the front end, thinking about problems, helpful at the back end, monitoring and evaluation, not in between. And I know there's been a lot of talk on Slido about does everything need to be done in Iceland? Does everything need to be done in Norway? My view is we need both local evidence from our own countries, but we also need to learn from global evidence. What's been learned from around the world? How does it vary by groups and context? And then what is applicable to our own country? I'll skip the next slide um, and just emphasize, it feels to me like 2022 is the year for every country to ask itself, what did we learn from COVID about how we support the use of evidence in decision making? And there's five reasons here that I mentioned. Political leaders who've been well and poorly served with evidence during COVID, huge amounts of innovation, biggest change has been living evidence products. We now maintain living evidence products that are updated every week as the context and the evidence change changes. Third point, I've been doing this for 25 years. I learned more about how to support decision making in the last two with COVID-19 than I had in the previous 23. And a lot of people feel similarly, and we need to get better at doing this. 
Um, and we have many societal challenges. The first thousand days are right up near the top of the list, and we need to figure out how do we better support the use of evidence in decision making. So I'll come back and we'll see where we are with the Slido questions. So uh, hopefully you've had a chance to rank order the six recommendations. Again, they're all important, but what we'd love to see is which did you feel were the most important. So I can't quite see that, but. First one, um, encouraging government to support A and B and to do some things that only government can do. You have to realize here in, in Scandinavia, yes. we are very institutional. All right. right. Okay. I have uh, roots in North America, as, as, you, as do you. That, right. that third uh, factor, that community-based, it's a little bit in a different. Absolutely, different state. So, so we've gone to the second question on this slide, the lower one, in a minute we'll come back to the first question, but very interesting that many of you anticipated that the big actions need to be taken by or at least supported by government. I think we would probably get uh, similar poll results in Canada. Um, but depending on who's in the room, there will be people who say, no, you know, well, we need to focus really on parents. Or at the end of the day, it's those frontline home visitors, frontline general practitioners and others who are going to drive change. So we need to focus on those. But, uh, but the last one, of course, you get your cake and you can eat it too because you get what government can do, but you're also saying that government has to enable the other two. The other two won't happen without government putting in place the supportive infrastructure. So could we, do we also have an answer to the first question about how people prioritize? Yep, uh, it came up and I went down. Uh, the first, uh, provide comprehensive support for parents in the first uh, thousand days, that came up uh, as number one. Yeah. Number two, recognize the importance of the first 1,000 days. Number three, identify and respond systemically uh, to risk factors. Four, improve equity and quality in services. Five, improve cross-sectoral collaboration. Six, advance research, knowledge, and understanding. Interesting, yeah. So a, a bit of a, in a way, a mismatch because you're seeing the most, well, not a mismatch, but you're seeing the most important thing is to support parents. Uh, and yet that wasn't the approach that was picked, but presumably it's because you think that government has to play a particularly key role in providing the architecture within which that happens. Second one is uh, recognize the importance. That one's, for me, super vague, unless you get to very concrete things like I've put with number one, implementation plans, because everybody can recognize stuff, but is government putting on the table an implementation plan that commits them to take action of a variety of different types? And if you want these reports to make a difference, you have to demand that. This will not happen by magic. Uh, we did a lot of assessments for the Evidence Commission of reports, and the vast majority of them go nowhere. They are read by a relatively small group of people, and they have no impacts on the ground. Impacts happen on the ground because people like you push and push and push and push, and over time, politicians respond, and this one would be about them making commitments that you and others can hold accountable. So that was your third choice. And then the final, identify and respond systematically, and that's very much what we heard about from the Norwegian presentation, also with the Danish presentation. Lots of great work being done, but we need to systematize that. Use the best tools. Study those tools so you have uh, Nordic-specific results, but really invest in using the right tools. And then if you think about that risk pyramid, getting the right interventions to people who need them based on those assessments. So again, interesting set of results. And with that, our time is finished, All right. unfortunately. Okay. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for your participation, your, your interest, and now we'll get back to business. Uh, it's almost time for lunch, uh, which will be served outside in the hallway where we registered in a buffet style. Uh, after lunch at 1240, at, I'm not in charge anymore, so you have to be very responsible, 1240, set your clocks. We will split into parallel workshops. Uh, you've already selected your workshops, uh, so or your, you know, your, your, the different conference sections. Um, a, group A will continue in this room after lunch, but workshop B will be in the room directly next door. 
And after the second coffee break at 2.30, workshop C will continue in this room and workshop D will then be in the room that workshop B was in. Um, after the final workshops, at four o'clock, we will continue today's event with a social gathering outside in the hall with some live music, non-alcoholic bubbles, and tasty treats for about an hour. We recommend you mingle, continue with that uh, uh, cross-sectional networking that's so important. Uh, there's no formal agenda for this event other than to simply relax after a long day. Uh, enjoy the refreshments and again, um, continue using uh, without the help of Slido. Um, I think I've missed something. Uh, before we can conclude this morning, are we gonna, there was, oh, there was only one question we were, oh, we have another question. Oh, I'm sorry, there did come in two questions. Two. You, should, we, should we give them applause to bring them back like in the uh, theater? <laughs> actually, my name's Ari and my grandfather was the president of Iceland and now I'm gonna do my comedy routine. Well done, <laughs> well done. Okay, question number one. Would you say politicians also need to have evidence that uh, it'll save money, uh, that it's an investment? I, I choose to use that word, that yeah, it's an investment. I, I think you know, they're very focused very often on value for money. There will be you know, right of center governments are sometimes elected with a cost containment uh, approach, which isn't necessarily about um, value for money. It's more about getting costs down. But it's very hard to find politicians who wouldn't be very focused on value for money. So if you can show that a particular investment is likely to improve care experiences, improve health outcomes, uh, and keep costs manageable, you're much more likely to get action, which is why any time we're in front of politicians, we always use the quadruple aim because they will inevitably say to us, reassure us that things will be better people's experiences will be better, health will be improved, and costs will be kept manageable. So absolutely part of the equation. Well, the second question was along the same line. Did you look into the importance of a fi financial investment being plausible in the now? Well, plausibility is always about particular countries at particular moments in time. And so, uh, you know, we sometimes sit there for years with areas that the evidence suggests we need to move on, but we don't do a big push because the political situation isn't right. So uh, I mentioned before, if you're trying to get on the agenda, politicians pay attention to three things. Do you have a compelling problem? Do you have a viable policy? And are the politics right? So, you know, if I use the American example, under Trump, a whole bunch of things were not possible. A number of other things were possible. The moment the presidency changes, different things become possible. Same in my jurisdiction, maybe not as dramatic between the two extremes, but as political parties become more or less powerful, as ministers change, as interest groups mobilize and do other things, opportunities come and go, and you have to be there ready to go with your compelling problem, with your viable policy. So a lot of my business is we have a lot of issues that are ready to go, and we're constantly reading the politics to see where there might be an opportunity for an evidence-driven solution that happens to align with that political context. I think you, you mentioned implementation, implementation plans, yep. and uh, we have a lot of those here in Iceland. I'm sure you Do can you? put up your hands, but a lot of times they're underfunded or not funded in right. certain actions. How do we hold governments accountable for uh, creating an implementation plan for you know, with certain objectives that we're very, are necessary and uh -huh. we're very fond of and we'd like to go to, but they're not invested. Absolutely. Well, you know, many tricks of the trade. It's, you know, implementation plans can be like reports that are developed and not necessarily acted on. But if you can uh, have metrics and if worse comes to worse, name and shame when people don't take action, uh, that can be one way. But if it's just an implementation plan and it's very vague, then you're not likely to get traction. If you are very specific and that is coupled with metrics where politicians know at a certain point in time, people are gonna come back and say, you didn't act on 17 of the 25 items. Uh, but also if there's explicit costing built into it, so you know the money is there to deliver on what they're saying that they're gonna do. So implementation plans need the metrics, but they also need the allocated budget so that people can actually deliver on them. But again, there's nothing magical about any of this. If you don't keep up the pressure, these things are likely gonna disappear over time. 
Okay, there were no further questions at this point. Great, thanks. Sorry, thanks, thanks for the return. <laughs>